Hello and welcome to this video. <coughs> Excuse me, welcome to this video where we're going to start talking about just a little bit uh, material on uh, counting, and the mathematical name for this is combinatorics. This roughly corresponds, roughly, with section 6.1 through 6.3 in our textbook, but my goal here is to produce sort of simplified notes that in case you need for, for a future course you'll have to look at and that these notes will be self-contained. So what I'd actually like to do is start off with these notes um, with a sample problem. Um, so this is one that I've borrowed from uh, another instructor, borrowed and very slightly modified. Um, and so here's what this question sounds like. It says, suppose the math department sells I love discrete math t-shirts and they come in five different sizes small, medium, large, extra large, and uh, extra, extra large. Um, shirts are available in four different colors, red, orange, yellow, and green, um, except extra large, which is only available in red, yellow, and green, and extra, extra large, which is only available in red and green. And so here's the question that we might want to think about. How many different types of shirts are there? How would you count all of the different types of shirts? So this is a great place to maybe pause the video and think about how you would actually manually count these um, and also how you might tell a computer to count this answer. But okay, let's think about this question. So we're trying to count different types of shirts. And the first thing we notice is that these shirts come in um, five different sizes. I'll even tell you them, but we said they were small, medium, large, extra large, and extra, extra large. And then, if you carefully read through what I've written above, the small shirts came in four colors, which was red, orange, yellow, and green. So did the medium shirts, red, orange, yellow, and green. So did the large shirts, red, orange, yellow, green, but the extra large shirts only came in three colors. Was it red, yellow, and green, so no orange. And the extra extra large only came in red and green. <clears throat> so this is, a, in my opinion, a helpful visual visualization. Um, uh, but it, what I really like about it is it's going to reveal to us some principles of counting, some sort of elementary ones um, that actually pop up a lot and are very powerful once you sort of practice using them. But okay, so how do I count all these different types of shirts? Well, I can sort of count the ends of this diagram down here. Let me maybe highlight one. I guess I've got an orange color. So, for example, this path I've highlighted is one type of shirt. That's a large orange shirt. And this path I've highlighted is a small orange shirt. Right, we can sort of keep playing this game. There's a small red shirt. There's a medium red shirt, a large red shirt an extra large red shirt, an extra extra large red shirt. So how many red shirt types are there? There's four, or sorry, five, one, two, three, four, five. How many orange shirt types are there? There's one, two, three, three oranges. We can then do this for yellow. There's a small yellow, a medium yellow, a large yellow, and an extra large yellow, so four yellows. And then finally we get to green. There's a small green, a medium green, a large green, an extra large green, and an extra extra large green. So the point is, 
once you, if you can set up a, a diagram like this, we can just count how many total of these paths there were. You might call these branches, because they're all sort of branching down. And when we do this count, we get 17. We get 17 different types. So many of you, of course, are familiar with uh, different comp sci terminology and questions. And what I'll say is that this diagram above is sometimes referred to as a counting tree. or maybe more simply a tree diagram. And for the type of questions that uh, the type of questions that maybe sound like the one I, I started off with, these can be a really effective way to count. Okay, so what are some of the more general principles that this first example, maybe brings to light. Well, one thing that this brings, that this maybe suggests, is that there's a sort of multiplicative property. So let me write this. This suggests um, a multiplicative property of counting. So I'll make this clear exactly what I mean. Um, some people will even, I think our textbook calls this a product rule, but where exactly is this showing up? Well, let's figure out how many small shirts were there. This is a different question, but the number of small shirts deals with this side of my diagram, just looking at how many things are here. And how would I count that? Well, there's one way to be a small shirt, your size small. But then you have four varieties of small shirt. So there's sort of a four times this one way to be a small shirt. So there's this embedded in this little um, picture or diagram, there's this multiplicative property. All right, let me, let me pose this um, a slightly different way. Maybe we could ask this question. How many orange shirts are there? Let's see if we can count this from the same question. Well, there's two places where orange shows up, and in each of those places, orange shows up only once. So there's exactly two ways to be orange. Um, you can be a small orange or a large orange. So there's only one way to be the color orange. So there's one orange color, but there's two sizes that have orange as a color. So if I multiply 1 times 2, I get the number of orange shirts. So we'll, we'll see this a little more clearly in a second, but the same exercise that we just talked about also suggests an additive property that you often encounter when you set up a counting problem. So for example, when we answered the initial question, we ended up saying there were 17 different types of shirts. And if you think about what we did, we first did the small shirts, and there were four of those, and then we said plus the medium shirts, plus the large, plus the extra large, plus the extra extra large. So, depending on what your counting problem is asking you to count, you might multiply different counts, or you might add different counts. And that's sort of where the beginnings, or the uh, introduction, I should say, of quote-unquote uh, elementary or initial, excuse me, 
um, combinatorics or counting starts to starts is with these observations about multiplying and um, adding. So let's start there. Um, okay, so the multiplicative rule for counting, and some people will call this the uh, product rule. It's another name for multiplying. The only reason I I, I avoid using the word product rules because uh, we're familiar with that name from maybe calculus. Okay, so what we want to say is if a count or a procedure can be thought of as a sequence of two counts or procedures, um, then we can relate the, the number of ways to do those procedures by multiplying. So here's what I kind of want to say. Um, we can say this in terms of tasks or procedures. So if a procedure can be broken up, or if you prefer to say it, decomposed into um, I'll say a sequence of two procedures or tasks. And now what I want to say is um, uh, where there are a ways, so a is a natural number, to do the first task, to complete the first task. And b ways to complete the second task. then there are a times b ways to complete the initial or original procedure. So this is a bit wordier than I usually like to make these things, but hopefully it makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, we might be able to say this a different way, but maybe maybe we'll we'll start with an example. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, how many? This is a type of question we've thought of for a while now. Um, bit strings of length four are there. So notice this is a counting question. This is asking you to count the number of elements in a set. So there's not really a procedure per se, right? You have to invent, the, you have to reinterpret this question if you want to use this language of a procedure from up top. But okay, how, how do we think about this? Well, um, a bit string is just a list of zeros and ones. So one, two, three, four. We have four empty slots because we want a bit string of length four. And so here's how you can think of a procedure. The procedure you're doing is, well, how can I build a bit string? That's maybe your whole procedure. And you can break it up into, f in this case, four different tasks to build your bit string. How do you build your bit string? Well, your first task might be to choose your first um, digit or option 
or an entry in the list. So how many choices are there for your first one? Well, that's either a zero or a one, so that's a two, a number of two choices. And how many different ways are there to build, to complete the next task? There's two choices, and how many different ways are there to do the third one? Two. And how many different ways are there to do the fourth one? There's also two. So what the multiplicative principle or, or <clears throat> rule tells us is that the total number, oh, I have two L's there, the total number of ways to make a bit string of length four, so the total number of bit strings of length four are, well, there's, according to this principle, it's the number of ways to complete each task and you multiply them. So two times two times two times two, and that's two to the fourth. Okay, so this is an example we have some familiarity with um, counting these sorts of things. Um, let's see, I want to, excuse me for a second. <coughs> Okay, I'm just getting some other things set up here. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, Um, so another way to think about this is um, rather than thinking about this in terms of procedures or tasks, um, this multiplicative rule, I actually find it's a little uh, more natural or common to think of it in terms of the language of lists. So multiplicative rule says suppose um, Suppose, oh, uh, in making a list of length n, that there are a one, that's a natural number, choices for the one entry, the first entry in the list. And there are A2 choices for entry two. And more generally, there are AI choices, whatever I is, for entry I all the way up to a n, whatever that is, choices for um, the final entry, entry, uh, entry number n. Then what's the punchline going to be? Then there are a1 times a2 times a3 dot 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 times 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 a n um, different lists you can make so um, I'm calling this the multiplicative rule I also called this up here the multiplicative rule when I use the word procedure these are saying the same thing again just using slightly different words for the same thing so let's try an example. Maybe I'll try and change the color. Um, oh, let's say you want to make you want to make the uh, uh, um, a standard license plate. Um, so let's say a 
um, license plate, a typical license plate um, consists of maybe three letters followed by four numbers. So consists of three, and what I mean by letters is for right now, uh, capital English alphabet letters, followed by four numbers. And the numbers, I really, you know what, rather than calling the numbers, I'm going to say four digits. And my question is, how many different license plates are there? Well, I like to think of this as a list. Every license plate is a list of three letters, one, two, three, followed by four digits, one, two, three, four. And how many choices do I have for each empty slot in the list? I have 26, because I have 26 letters, and 26, um, and 26 for those. And then for these, how many digits I have? I can make it a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So I have 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices. So my product rule, my multiplicative rule, tells me there are 26 times 26 times 26 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 license plates. This is all the multiplicative rule is saying. Right, you can even, um, maybe I'll make a sort of follow-up example. Um, what if we also say, well, included in a license plate, what if the license plate also shows um, license plate, why is it place? The license plate also shows the state. I'm assuming this is all taking place in our country. Now how many? Well, this one doesn't quite feel like a list, but we can think of it as a list. So we already know, right, we had one, two, three letters, and one, two, three, four digits, or numbers, and now what do we have? Maybe I'll put it at the end here. Now we could think of this as an extended list where now we have a slot that tells us the state. Maybe it you know, just has a picture of it or, or the abbreviation for it. But we already counted each of these, 26 to the third, and all of these would be 10 to the fourth, but now there's 50 states. Right, so now we're saying, wait, each state now makes each one of these previous license plates a different license plate. You may have the license plate, I don't know, A, B, C, um, 7, 8, 3, 4, and I may have that same license plate, only my license plate is in Maryland, and your license plate is in Texas. So now we have two versions of the same license plate, and now they're different. So we could have all the same number of license plates from before, but we have 50 new options um, to call them different. So license plates that also show what state you're from, there would be a total of 26 to the third times 10 to the fourth times 50 um, of these state information license plates. Okay, so when I think about these sorts of examples, I tend to think about lists. That makes more sense to me. 
But sometimes, especially from a computer science point of view, you might want to think about procedures or tasks. Okay, let's keep going. Um, let's go next with the um, additive, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the additive rule or additive, the sum rule, um, excuse me. Yeah. So the addition rule, or I think some people will call this the sum rule, either way is good. And here's one way, just like with the multiplicative one, there might be other ways to say it, but here's one way we can say it. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to use this, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, in the language of sets. I'm going to say, suppose we have a finite set. Suppose a finite set, I'll just call it capital S, can be written as the union um, of other sets of subsets. So I'll just write it like this. S equals subset one, union subset two, union dot dot dot. And then we go up to some some number of subsets um, maybe, maybe n of them, subset n. And um, every two of these subsets have no elements in common. Let me state that purely mathematically, like in symbols. That is, if you take subset, maybe it's S1, maybe it's S10, subset SI, and you intersect it with a different subset, subset SJ, when you say, hey, what do those two subsets have in common? It's nothing, it's the empty set. And this is when I is not equal to J, so they're different subsets. Visually, what this means is you have some finite set so that's S, and I'm going to put like just these silly little dots everywhere. Those are like the elements of S. And now what I'm going to do is break S up into different sets. So I might have S1, S2, S3, S4, in my case S5, and S6. Then what happens, what's really happening here is then all the elements in S got completely uh, divided amongst all these different subsets. That's not to say that they all have the same size, that's just to say that the total size of S is the sum of the sizes of these subsets, however many of them we needed. Um, I'll remind you, we mentioned this in class, but this was like before spring break. This right here, when two sets intersect and you get nothing, oh, there's a word for this. This is, the word for this is disjoint. So what we're really saying here is that if you want to count the elements in a finite set S, and if you can break up your finite set into a bunch of disjoint smaller subsets, then to count the elements in S, which is really what we're after, so this is the size of S, this is the count of the number of elements 
in S, it's the sum of the number of elements in each subset. But notice this only works if these subsets over here um, don't overlap. So we'll, I'll, I'll try an example in a second, but hopefully it's kind of clear. Um, okay. Oops, excuse me. All right. Um, Yeah, so, so, let me, I was looking for a good example, let me look for, sorry, I know, I know it's just boring to stare at my bizarre screen here. Okay, so let's try this one. Um, example, maybe I'll put it in blue. How many length, I think I want to do length four, non-repetitive lists can be made. Um, length four, non-repeating list can be made using um, I've just got to make up some symbols using the symbols A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Um, if our list must contain the symbol E. Okay. Okay, so what I'd like to do is sort of over explain this example um, by letting S be the set of, let me just say, the set of these lists. So S is going to be the set of length four lists that don't repeat, that are made from these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven symbols that must contain the letter E. And so what I'm going to do is say, okay, I really want to count all the things in S. So that's going to be S. Um, but what I'm going to break it up into, turns out, I can think about breaking it up into some smaller non-overlapping, or if you will, disjoint subsets. And I think the way I'm going to think about this is for this question, I'm going to break it up into four subsets. And so one way to think about this, right, is just to say, okay, well, my list one, two, three, four must have four choices, and there's got to be an E somewhere in this list. And so what we can first say is, okay, what are the different ways we can have an E at the start. So that'll be my subset S1, all of these lists that have an E at the start. And then I have to count how many options there are for S1. Um, for S2, I'm gonna say, okay, what if I put, I say, let's put all the things that have an E as the second slot. And they'll let me count all of those. For S3, I'll say, what, let's count all the lists 
that have E as the third slot, and the final subset, S4, will have E as its fourth entry. So how many different ways are there to do this? Well, this is kind of a nice example, I think, because just to count how many elements are in subset S1, I'm going to use my multiplicative rule. Right? How many choices do I have for this second slot? Well, let's think about it. I just know I can't use E. So I have, I'm just going to, rather than write the the actual choice of the letter for the second slot, I'm just going to tell you how many choices there are. So I have to choose from these um, seven symbols, and I can't use E because that would be repeating. Okay, so that leaves me one, two, three, four, five, six choices. But once I've made a choice for this one, let's pretend it was G, I don't really know what it was. Once I've made a choice for this one, then I can't pick it again. So now there are one fewer choices. There's one, two, three, four, five choices left here. And once I've made a choice in this slot, then there's only four remaining choices left over. And so I'm using the multiplicative principle here. Um, how many elements are in S1? Six times five times four. How many elements are in S2? We can do the same thing. We can say, well, there's six choices for this one because I can't pick E. And then there's five remaining choices for this entry and four remaining choices here. And so similarly, from this example, what we can see is that the size of S1 is 6 times 5 times 4, which is 120. And that's also the size of S2. And that's also the size of S3. And that's also the size of S4. So what this tells us by the additive property, that the size of S, none of these subsets overlap. They're all disjoint. And so the cardinality, the size of S, is the adding up of all these subset sizes. And this is going to be 120 added up four times. So this is four times 120, so this will be 480. Okay, so that's one type of example of this addition principle, um, this sum rule. If we can break up the set of things we're trying to count into a bunch of non-overlapping, a bunch of disjoint pieces, then we can just count each piece and add those up. That's all this is saying. All right, let's continue. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's let's think about this one. Um, there are maybe I'll put this in black. There are lots of examples where both timesing and adding, both the multiplicative and addition rules are used. Um, our shirt example that kicked off this uh, little video is one of them. Um, here's one that might be relevant, and this one I'm borrowing from again a friend it's uh, this one might be relevant for some of our computer science friends uh, this is counting the number of passwords 
So you need a little bit of, you know, I need to make this a little bit of a word problem. So let me get all this information out here. Um, so uh, users of a certain blank, maybe it's a program, maybe it's an app, of an app are required to set up a password. And here are the rules for the password that they are required to set up. Um, each password must be six to eight characters long. Um, so let me write those passwords must, rule one, be six to eight characters or symbols long. Two, um, and each character, each symbol, is an uppercase letter or a digit. And then the last of the rules is that each password must contain at least one digit. Okay. And so here's the question. How many passwords are possible? Because once one of your app users picks a password, then that prevents another app user from using that same password. So another way to maybe phrase this question is, if, if you're the developer of this app, What's the maximum number of users you can enroll um, if the if you go by these rules for a password? So I want to um, I want to point out just a couple of quick observations. Maybe just note um, it is kind of natural here to think of the addition rule. I think, and, and let me just sh sort of highlight some words that aren't quite here yet. One keyword that I'm about to say uh, that tells you, oh, I'm going to be adding some counts going to be adding some sizes of subsets. And this is, the first rule isn't so firm, right? It's not saying passwords must be exactly six symbols long. They must be six or seven or eight. So passwords are six or seven or eight symbols long. And it's this word or Whenever you naturally think of or, what you're really doing in a problem like this, the word or really suggests you're breaking up into subsets. That's what the, right, the or really is kind of a union. A union B is A or B. And so this leads us to, oh, we're probably going to use the addition rule. Once you spot the word or, that can tell you, that can point to the different subsets that you might be trying to count. So let's let S, maybe I'll change colors here, let's let S be the set of all possible passwords under these rules. Well, of course, what we want to find is, what this question is saying is, how big is S? And all I'm saying is, once you read rule one and you use the word or, what you're naturally doing is breaking this up into three, hopefully disjoint, subsets. What is S1? S1 might be the subset where the set of passwords of length six. 
and S2 might be the set of passwords of length 7. And S3 might be the set of passwords of length 8. So all of this already, we're already using a lot of nerdy math talk to set this up, and it's all triggered by the simple word OR. If you're a password, then you're either length 6, length 7, or length 8. What all I'm saying is if you're a password, you're in S, and you're either in set 1, S2, or S3. So our goal or strategy here is to um, count each subset we've naturally set up, and then add up those counts. Okay, so let's see how this will work here. Let's just focus on counting S1. So maybe I'll switch back to black. Counting the size of this finite set S1. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, options for the type of password in S1. I'm scrolling up to look at the other rules. Um, and we have that each symbol is an uppercase letter or digit, and each password must contain at least one digit. Okay, so what we're going to end up doing here. Um, is maybe counting uh, set one, the passwords of length six. Okay. Um, and there's, there's a couple different ways to do this. I just want to set up a good way. Um, let's see. Uh, Oh, give me a second. Let me think about the best way of saving this. Yeah, so there's a nice sort of um, uh, simple way to count the number of passwords here. If we could pick, if our password um, was all uh, oh, give me a second, sorry. Oh gosh, I'm sorry guys, I'm, I have to, uh, shoot, sorry, I'm trying to think about this and now I'm getting called. Uh, let me at least mute my mic, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I had to help my kid with something. Okay, so um, there's there's a couple different ways to count. Where are we? S1, yeah, the passwords are link six. There's a couple of different ways to count what's in here. Um, I'm going to do it this way because it might just make these notes a little shorter, which we probably need at this point. But um, what I can do is sort of say, okay, how many options are there for this guy for the first entry? Well, the first entry might be um, a digit 
in which case there are 10 options, or the first entry could be a letter, in which case there are 26 options. So how many total options do I have? I have 36 total options. I get to choose from one of 10 digits or one of 26 uppercase letters. And this gets repeated for each possible entry in the list. So you might think, hey, it looks like I have 36 options for each entry. So that's 36 to the 6. The only problem here, this is a good count, except it doesn't take into account the rule that says, rule 3, each password must contain at least one digit. So I have to say, OK, um, I need to subtract from this total count. I need to subtract off all those passwords um, that don't contain any digits. So I have to take away from this passwords with no digits. For example, when I said this could be 36 to the 6, I could have chosen the password A, B, C, D, E, F. And I need to say, oh, wait, I need to incorporate rule 3 to say that's not an allowed password. Okay, so how do I do this? Well, how many passwords have no digits? If you think about that, that means I'm picking for each one of these slots in my password list, I'm picking only a letter. And there's 26 choices for each one. So each one has 26 ways to be just a letter. There's six of those, so that's my multiplicative rule. So one way to count what's in S1, the passwords of length six, is to count all the possible ways of making a password and to throw out all the ones that rule three said you couldn't do. So this gives us the size of S1. Similarly, the size of S2, the passwords of length seven, it's going to be very similar. We'll say, well, you can pick between 36 symbols, a digit or 26 uppercase letters for each of the seven slots. Oh, but you may have accidentally picked all letters, throw all of the ways to do that away. And that's got to be the passwords of link seven. And so finally, how many passwords of link three are there? It's going to be similar, 36 to the eight minus 26 to the eighth. So the total number of passwords is the size of s is the size of s1 plus the size of s2 plus the size of s3 and that is the size of s is 36 to the sixth minus 26 to the sixth plus 36 to the seventh minus 26 to the seventh plus 36 to the eighth minus 26 to the eighth. Okay, you can actually write this down as a number and I leave it to your, your hopefully piqued curiosity to figure out what huge number that is. Um, you can put that into a calculator, computer or something. Um, but okay. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, sorry, I was going to say I'm going to conclude these notes there, but I'm not. Um, I'm going to finish these notes um, with a discussion of a really important principle. Okay, these, I think this part comes from 6.2. And this is what's called the pigeonhole principle. It's actually a really straightforward idea. Um, so it's a little strange in some ways um, that that it uh, uh, gets such an important, such a name, right? Lots and lots of people know this as the pigeonhole principle. And when you think about it, it really just makes a lot of sense. Um, 
So here's I'm going to really state the pigeonhole principle by giving you an example. Um, and I think I let me check to make sure I spelled pigeon correctly. Yeah, okay. If twenty pigeons are flying or flocking to uh, I don't know occupy nineteen um, pigeon holes then something must happen and maybe we'll leave this as a blank so what what we're saying here is you have 19 pigeon holes I don't exactly know that that is but maybe maybe there's some that I'll make here So I just made eight, and maybe that's probably going to make 16. And then there's three right here. And so here's the problem. Your pigeons are trying to nest in a hole. There's 20 pigeons and there's 19 holes. If you don't want to think about birds, because birds are disgusting evolved dinosaurs that are absolutely terrifying, maybe you can just think about these as um, boxes and you have 20 marbles you're trying to put uh, in 19 different boxes. What's gonna have to happen? Well, okay, you're clearly gonna get some pigeons you could have the situation, that's not the letter M, that's my drawing of a pigeon, where the pigeons are sort of introverts, they don't want to stay in the same place, but you have this one leftover pigeon, and he's got to go somewhere. If he's got to go to a pigeonhole, then he's got to, there's got to be a double occupancy. So the conclusion here is that at least one pigeonhole contains more than one pigeons. Now I want to be clear here, it could actually be worse than this, right? You could, it might be that one of the pigeonholes for some reason stays empty. And so in this new arrangement that I'm now drawn, two of the pigeonholes have more than one. You could even have a weird situation where more than two have more than one. But the pigeonhole principle says at, in this setup, at least one, um, one pigeonhole has to have more than one. So this principle, you can actually prove it. You can restate it purely in terms of math. Um, right? The sort of math version goes like this. Um, math version. If a set S has k plus 1 elements, a much shorter way of saying this would be the size or cardinality of s is a number k plus 1, and s is expressed as the union of k different subsets, then the size, the cardinality of one of these subsets has to be bigger than one for at least one of them. So I'll say for some i. This is a very set way to say it, obviously. So what's going on compared to my pigeonhole example up above is the set um, is actually the number of pigeons, and the number of subsets was the number of pigeonholes. Right? Um, I can state this, let me sort of rewrite this in a more 
colloquial version. So in other words, if k plus 1 objects um, are going to be uh, uh, placed into k plus 1 boxes, sorry, are placed into k boxes, then um, uh, then at least one box contains two or more objects. And when you think about it this way, this just makes sense. Especially when you think of our pigeonhole example. Um, I will say the proof for this is actually pretty straightforward, so I'll let you look at it either online, um, feel free to Google this. The proof, uh, the standard way to do it is by contradiction. So I'll just sketch just sort of the main point of this proof, that way it leaves you something to think about. What you would do is you should you would say, well suppose not. In my subset version of this, I would say um, suppose that each of my subsets, S sub i, um, equals 1. Or really, I, should, I could say is less than or equal to 1. I'm, maybe one of my subsets is empty, sort of silly. But then what happens? Well, then you can structure your contradiction because you can count the number of elements in S. Right? If we assume these are disjoint subsets, then the size of S is the sum of all of these SIs. And when I add those up, I'll get more. I'll get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Um, I'll get K. And I'll get the size of S is K. So this will actually tell me the size of S is less than or equal to K. And that'll be my contradiction. Um, I think I forgot to say something, sorry, in my mathy version, I'm sorry. If a set S has k plus 1 elements and um, k subsets, I should say, um, I really should say that they're disjoint subsets. Sorry about that. That makes this argument a little clearer. So the, the subsets can be empty, but they can't, uh, they can't overlap. Okay, so that's the pigeonhole principle. Um, it actually pops up uh, is in a lot of different ways. Um, let me steal this example. So here's another example. I'm going to state it as a claim amongst any group of 367 people, at least two must have the same birthday. And I'll be clear here, you have to exclude the year. So by birthday, I mean month slash day. Okay, why on earth is this true? Well, we can just say it in words. If there's 367 people, the worst case scenario is that person one, um, the first 365 people, I'll say, are each born on a different day. And you say, oh, there could be a leap year, so maybe the first 366 people are born on different days of the year. But what about that 367th person? Well, she's got to be born on a day of the year, too, so it's got to be, it's got to overlap with one of the previous 366 people.
right? So to put this in the language of the pigeonhole principle, if I want to use sets, right, um, I might say that my set S is a set of people, and there's 367. Um, and so then I'll have S1 will be the set of all people born on January 1st. And then you, they're going to have a lot of subsets. S2 will be the subset of people born on January 2nd. Don't worry, I'm not going to write all these out. Right? And then dot, 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 I'll even, um, let's see, there's 31 days in January, so S sub 31 would be the last day in January. People born on January 31st. Uh, and so um, S sub, let's see, 32 would be February 1st. So 28 would be 15. So S sub 60, I'm going to say this is the leap year one. This would be the set of all people born on February 29th. Anyways, if you keep this up, S sub 366 would be the set of all people born on December 31st. And so this is precisely a situation where we have k plus 1 elements and k subsets. So the worst case scenario is you put together a room of 367 people, and the first 366 people you talk to each have a different birth date. So each one goes into one of these little sets, these subsets or boxes, and the 367th person must also go into one of them. Okay. Let me just conclude this set of notes with, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, the generalized, well, actually, so I won't say that, but one thing, one random, it's not so connected, but interesting thing to think about or look up, I'll call it a factoid. So don't waste your time with this unless you're bored or need some distraction. Um, so one thing you can answer this question, what's, what's the smallest number of people you can have in a room so that you know two people have the same birthday? Well, by this pigeonhole principle, it's got to be 367. Okay, here's a slightly different question. How many people do you need so that the probability, not that you know with 100% probability, but just the probability that two of them share a birthday, the probability that there are two people that share a birthday is it 100%? We answer that with the pigeonhole principle, but that the probability is just bigger than 50%. What's the smallest number of people you need for this? And what's kind of interesting here um, is that uh, um, oh, sorry. Um, Oh, uh, sorry. Um, so, what's interesting here is it's a surprisingly low number. If you wanted the probability to be 100%, that is, you know for certain, you need 367 people. But if you want the probability to just be 99.9%, you only need 70 people. So this isn't, 
this isn't a question that this class is about, but I just had to mention it. This is a bizarre finding that you need so few people to have such a high probability. In fact, you should look up how few people you need to reach 50% so that it's better to take this bet. And this is called the birthday paradox. But okay, so I'm gonna upload one more set of lecture notes where um, I'm gonna talk about the generalized pigeonhole principle. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is a little bit more about counting. Um, in that last upload. And so I will also be putting together a final exam and getting great information out to you guys. Thank you so much for your patience on all this. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how things go. Um, so I'll give you more information about your final, when it's due and what I'm gonna put on there and whether or not you even have to take it. All right, I hope you guys are doing well and I'll talk to you later.